Admittedly, I've been a lurker on this subreddit for a few years now. I've tried to type out my story numerous times, but always struggled to wade through the pieces as they've gotten more and more jumbled and foggy with time. I can't say I was traumatized by what happened. I'm not sure if it makes me a messed up person, but I typically tell this story at parties to manipulate drunk acquaintances into thinking I've survived something cool. Okay, let's get into it. In 2015, I was 19 years old and working for the summer at a Bible camp for inner city kids. I'm going to leave out the city name, but just know that, obviously, crime occurs frequently in big cities, and this one was no different. I had been assured that this neighborhood, however, was in the process of being gentrified, and they had even just opened up a hipster coffee shop and dog park right down the street. Just to give you a really clear visual, this neighborhood had dilapidated houses with trash out in the front, right next to houses with immaculate yards and square modern architecture. The Bible camp where I was working was essentially just a huge two-story house with a large fenced-in yard. Again, we were assured that we were safe because we had bars on the windows, and the outer doors locked automatically when they shut. The camp was conducted downstairs, and the summer counselors, there were four of us, lived in the small upstairs that was off limits during the day to the kids. Our camp ran five days a week from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then the time was ours to explore the city, rest, or whatever. Probably enough to get to the story now. I love a good setting, and it could be important later. One weekend night in July, we were all just hanging in the house making a spaghetti dinner. We each got our own stipend for food, so we divided it accordingly for meals, and then bought our own snacks and stuff. We were also in charge of preparing lunch and snacks for the kids on camp days, so we had two fridges and two pantries. As you can probably guess, we labeled them Camp Fridge and Pantry and one was labeled Staff Fridge and Pantry. We also were super petty and wrote our names all over our snacks in the fridge. My best friend worked at the camp with me, we will call her Chris, and it was our turn to cook that night. So I went into the staff fridge to grab the ground beef. I immediately noticed that my case of Go-Gurts was gone. They were my go-to snack and I bought like three cases a week. I had just opened my last box like an hour before to have one and left it in front of the ground beef. It sounds crazy, but I knew I did. I closed the fridge door and headed to the dining room, Chris closely behind me and yelled at everyone else. Who stole all my gogurt? That night, in addition to Chris and myself, there were the two other summer counselors, two permanent counselors that lived in the area and the cousin of one of the permanent counselors everyone looked at me wide-eyed then looked around blankly i figured it was the cousin because i had never met her before so i sucked it up and said whatever just if it has a name on it please don't eat it then i pulled chris back into the kitchen to finish up the spaghetti we all ate dinner and then the two permanent counselors volunteered to do the dishes because we let them eat with us. The rest of us headed back upstairs to get comfy in the sitting room on the couches and turn on Family Guy. We were only like two minutes in when the cousin, we'll call her Sarah, said, Wait, I can't find my phone or wallet. I paused the show and rolled my eyes, still annoyed about the gogurt. Chris said, where did you last have them? And Sarah said she left them on the couch before we went downstairs to dinner. Naturally, we all started looking around the small room, turning over couch cushions, looking under the couches behind them, under blankets, really wherever. Finally, we asked, are you sure you didn't leave them downstairs? She agreed to head downstairs to look with the other two and Chris and I went into our room which was connected to the sitting room. We flopped down on the bottom of our bunk bed, and I proceeded to talk smack about Sarah, who I felt was ruining our chill night. 
Our door was open, and I was shocked when I saw a hand kind of sneak into view like it was going to grab the door frame. I said, hey, did you find them? Thinking that Sarah or the other two had somehow made it back upstairs without me hearing them, and had heard me talking smack for the past five minutes. But the hand immediately disappeared out of the door frame and there was no response. I looked at Chris like what the hell, and she was looking back at me confused because she never saw the hand. I quickly explained what happened and then we both jumped up and headed to the top of the stairs. We yelled down for the others and they yelled back that they hadn't found them yet. By this point I was freaked out because, who was up here with us? Of course were those people though and we started looking around upstairs in our bedroom, the other bedroom, and in the sitting room. We found nothing and no one. We decided not to say anything yet because I might sound insane. And also, how could someone have gotten downstairs so fast without us hearing them? When we got downstairs, Sarah was super upset and crying. Her cousin said, Come on guys, did someone take her stuff? But Chris and I both knew we didn't and we said so. Sarah screamed that obviously someone took them and we should just be honest. And then things got heated. I finally decided then to tell them about the hand because I felt like it would maybe reduce the tension between us. It did, but then everyone panicked. We ran around the house like maniacs, looking in every closet or hiding place the kids use, and found nothing and no one. We ended up calling our camp director to come over because the situation had just devolved into chaos. When he got there, we were all sitting huddled in the foyer freaked out, and we explained what we could. He just didn't seem convinced that someone was in the house and threatened to call the cops if one of us didn't give Sarah back her things. Well, none of us fessed up, so we called the cops and they came over and searched the property and took our statements. It seemed so dumb as we repeated our stories, but we didn't have much to go off of but a feeling. They did write a report for stolen property and that made Sarah feel better at least. With the house secure, everyone left except us four summer counselors who lived there. We spent the night in the same room with the door barricaded, reassuring ourselves that we were being stupid and that the phone and wallet would actually turn up somewhere random and we would laugh about it. Fast forward a few days. We had relaxed a bit. We hadn't found Sarah's things like we expected but nothing else weird had happened and we had been occupied with the kids and the job in general. The kids had all gone home at this point and it was just the four of us again at the house. We finished cleaning up the outside, locked the gate and headed in the dining room door. We were all hungry and wanted snacks. Chris got to the kitchen first and said, someone left the kitchen door open again. I mean, it was kind of weird, but Kids go in and out that door all day, so of all the doors to be open, this is the least weird. She shut it. And then I noticed that the staff fridge door was also cracked open. Then who knows what possessed me, but I said, Oh no y'all, he's back. We all laughed because we thought this was ridiculous. Chris grabbed a broom, held it as a weapon and said, Let's get him girls. She started to throw open the pantry doors, screaming, Where the hell are you? And we know you're in here, show yourself. I followed behind her laughing, but I started to inexplicably feel uneasy and nervous. She continued her charade into the next room, throwing open two more closet doors. Then she moved into the front room and opened that closet door. She started another confident, We know you're... When she stopped mid-sentence and screamed so loudly that the skin on my neck prickled. Then she threw the broom in the closet and sprinted out the front door, leaving it open. My heart was pounding so hard at this point, but I thought she was messing with us. So I turned around and went the other way into the foyer and out the front door. 
I saw her booking it down the street towards the coffee shop and I was like, okay, what is she doing? As soon as I turned back around to find the others, he was just there, an older man looking really dirty with hardly any teeth. He was just grinning at me. He had his hands up and said, I didn't mean no harm, while slowly backing away down the street in the other direction. It was so creepy because even though he said this, it was like he didn't mean it. It was like his tone and the grin were mocking me. I was frozen for a second, then I sputtered out. You can't just, um, leave. And he just said again with that grin. I didn't mean no harm. Then turned and ran. I fumbled in my pocket for my phone and dialed 911. Then went to follow him, but as soon as I reached the edge of the house, he was gone. The next events are kind of a blur. It sounds wild, but we really all thought we just freaked ourselves out. No way in hell did we actually think someone was in the house. The cops took our statements and reminded us that we needed to keep the doors shut at all times, no matter what. Our director apologized profusely for not initially believing us. My parents wanted me to come back home for the remainder of the summer, but I was like, uh, what else could happen? Chris was the one who had it the worst. She was terrified to stay in that house. She told me later that when she opened the door, he was just grinning at her with dead eyes, like he was waiting for her to finally find him. She said she would never forget his face. We're still best friends at almost 30 years old, and I can't bring up that summer to her if she hasn't been drinking. That's basically it. I think what kept me up at night after that were just unanswered questions. Like how long had he been in the house? Why did he randomly decide to take the phone and wallet of the one person who didn't work there? Had he listened to our private conversations, watched us get dressed and shower? How much food had he stolen that we didn't notice? Where had he gone when we were looking for him on spaghetti night? What hiding places did we miss? Was he under my bed at night or at any point during my stay? I don't know all these answers and I know I'll never have them. But I'm thankful our interaction wasn't worse, I guess. So, a creepy grinning squatter who lived among us for God knows how long. Let's not meet. Here are a collection of mini stories detailing my lifetime of bad neighbors. Story 1. We were living in a fast deteriorating little chunk of suburbia. The Darling Park behind our house was now a haven for the homeless, as was our pool and garden. Little birds and squirrels had been replaced by raccoons and feral cats, and the mint greenhouse down the street was overflowing with people, domestic violence and probably math rather than charisma. My dad, being the fighty bastard he was, was constantly calling the cops on the inhabitants of the greenhouse when they'd really get into it, and after months of uncharacteristic silence, their retaliation finally came. Mom was out of town. I was awoken by Dad shaking me awake, telling me that we needed to get up. The garage was on fire. He had already moved the cars away from it, but now he needed to hustle my brother and me in ages 7 and 5 respectively out and then pop back in for the pets. He was made aware of this fact by the main man of the greenhouse himself, stinking like booze and looking very nervous as he knocked on our door and said, Hey, you should probably do something about that, and then disappearing for almost a year. The fire was ruled arson due to the probable incendiary device, but nobody cared enough to question Greenhouse Guy, until he landed himself in the paper for blowing up the meth lab basement of his new house in a way that was damn near indistinguishable from the way he ruined our garage. Classy. Story 2. New Neighborhood. Having your garage burned down tends to leave a sour taste in the mouth. We got out of there and into somewhere a bit safer. A bit. This place was a bit more rural. 
Neighboring homes were probably 150 to 200 feet away, and the road, being a dead end, was only trafficked by residents, and usually either early in the morning or in the evening as people went to work and came home. I was probably 11, home alone in the early afternoon on a bright and quiet day, chipper as can be, when I am scared out of my skin by a tremendous knocking on the door, fast and hard. I, being 11 and also me, ducked out of the window locked up in fear and hoped it would go away. It didn't, not for another five minutes anyway, and the speed and intensity of the knock didn't let up a bit. Finally, it ceased all at once. No meandering knocks, nothing. Silence. I tentatively looked at the window and noted an unfamiliar, skinny, bald white man, unusual for the neighborhood, maybe 50, who was, to my relief, marching angrily up the driveway back toward his motorcycle, which was parked by the mailbox. All my growing calm was shattered, however when he proceeded to open and slam shut the door of the mailbox for a few minutes clearly pissed and occasionally reaching in like he was putting something in there. Finally, he got on his motorcycle, drove down to the cul-de-sac, came back up the street and left forever. Nothing was in the mailbox when my parents got home and checked. Maybe not so scary now, but scary as hell then. Story 3 Maybe 12 years old now, changing in my room, and kind of taking my sweet time about it. It's daytime, so I'm not worried about someone seeing into my room or anything. Still half naked, I just had a weird feeling, and whipped my head around just in time to see some guy stood stock still in front of the house, cover his face, flip me off, and walk all the way past the house with his middle finger still up. Story 4 Age 18, living alone for the first time in a gorgeous cottage maybe a mile from the beach, 1,100 square feet all to myself, or so I assumed. The first time I'm visiting it, my landlord who lived next door had me wait a moment so I could meet her grandson. She calls up to him. I hear feet running down the stairs, and out runs the sweetest little boy with a fresh-picked flower in his hand. Oh, wait, no. Outruns a 50-year-old, six-foot-tall man in dirty clothes who can't even look me in the eyes. Oh, she meant quite an older son, and boy, is he something. Huh. I mostly forget about it, though, assuming this won't really be part of my life there, and put down a security deposit and move in. A month later, I'm lugging my boxes in and notice the door is already open. I walk in. Oh, there is my landlord's son carrying the cottage's TV back to where it was when I was touring the place. Before I can even set my box down or ask why or how he's doing that, he rambles off a speech about how he's going to be working in the basement for a few weeks. But I won't even know he's there. Cue tears in my eyes of just pure what the heck. But I'm still the scared 11-year-old I used to be. So I just smiled and said okay and mouthed. Please tell him he can't to my mother, who was cackling. He ended up working down there for about five months. It became routine. His sneeze echoing through the vents became my alarm clock. I got a good chuckle out of him clearly watching out his window to see when I would leave my house and timing his own excursion so that he could run into me and strike up a brief ambling conversation. Once... I walked to the back of the house to see only his hands sticking out of a basement window. Still my go-to funny story sometimes. He had a crush on me for sure and I honestly just found it more entertaining than anything. And I felt sympathetic toward him too. Never mind his permanent residency underneath my house, he was just a shy fix-it man. Things started to turn however. His mother, my landlord would ask to do her laundry in my house because she didn't want to go to the laundromat. I was 18 and didn't know how to say no, so in she would come and stay for eight hours straight just doing load after load after load. Sometimes she'd leave me $5 per load. Sometimes she'd leave me old chocolates. 
The plumbing in my house went wonky, and she refused to answer her door, phone, or email for days. She told the plumber I called to leave, thinking I couldn't hear her. She'd make an appointment for maintenance men to come by and insist she'd handle it, only to leave me having to deal with some poor confused guy with no one to report to at 9 in the morning, and then say that that was her handling it. She'd call me on garbage night to remind me to lug my empty trash can to the street and attempt to tattle on me to my mother when I'd say that I wasn't going to take an empty can out because... Hello, that didn't make sense. Finally, everything came to a head around Christmas. I was visiting with them for the holidays shortly after the suicide of a very close friend of mine. My landlord's comforting words. A bunch of people killed themselves during the Great Depression. Okay. Same night, her son comes downstairs and actually offers lovely condolences. He says he has a Christmas gift for me as I got a small one for him. His adult sister also happens to be over. He runs upstairs and is up there for several minutes before returning with a small print of a painting he made just for me. Genuinely so touching and sweet. But something about the way he's looking at me is making me dizzy. I'm suddenly aware of how much bigger than me he is, and how hot it is in the house, and how low my dress's neckline is. His one-on-one -on -one broad daylight flirtations made me laugh, but him looking at me like I'm lunch in his own house is making me queasy. He starts to mumble to me about how I can come up to his bedroom whenever I need or want to, to print stuff, of course. His sister, who was in her 40s and had just ascertained that I was 18, leaned in and asked in a teasing voice, Gee, big bro, can I come up and print stuff? He blushes and giggles and says a, what I can only describe as demure. No, and then he, his sister and his mom all lean in together and giggle conspiratorially. At which point I just sort of laugh to myself in a, what the heck is happening uncomfortable way and just coasted until it was time for me to go home. I moved out a month later, 